or moderator for this particular session. Um, last webinar, we focused on introduction to Agile, and um, today we'll be looking at introduction to discipline Agile. Um, let's hold on, just wanted to share my screen. So we have Scott Ambler here with us. He's going to be having this presentation. But before um, I would hand over the mic to him, I would first of all want every one of us to note that um, the Agile in Africa webinar series is an initiative of Project Management Institute Africa with Agile experts from across Africa. Um, the Agile expert group, we call them the Agile Think Tank group. And um, they are also part of us here. Uh, we have Alex Bagudi, Grace Johnson, Peter Motosho, Yannick Erikion, Clement Kitetu also, you know, working with us to actually drive this initiative. Primarily, our focus is to create a strong awareness of agile mindset across Africa to individuals and organization. So quickly, I move on to our agenda. So like I said, we have Scott Ambler here with us. He is the um, Vice President and Chief Scientist of the Discipline Agile at PMI. Um, before I, I will hand over the mic to him once again, um, just to let you know that the agenda basically has to do with, first of all, we have the welcome messages, um, welcome message to attendees from me, and welcome message also um, from for Scott Ambler. I've actually done that. Um, then we'll have introduction and presentation for, from Scott, who will take us up to 45 minutes. Then the Q&A sessions um, will take about 15 minutes and also closing remark also about three minutes. So basic housekeeping rules. Um, all participants, please note that it's expected that you mute um, your videos and ensure you turn it off. Feel free to continue networking in the chat box. If there are questions, submit your questions on the chat box and put Q before you question so that we will easily spot it. The session is being recorded and recording and slides will be shared on email after the session. We look forward to having a great meeting and getting your feedback at the end of this session. So at this juncture, I would like to welcome Scott Ambler to take over the stage. Welcome again, Scott Ambler. It's really happy. We're really happy and pleased to actually have you here in this session. Over oh, to you, Scott. You. All right. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, taking time out of your uh, busy evenings to, to come and listen to this talk. Uh, what I'm going to do, as you've heard, is uh, give you a, a, a brief introduction to Dispin Agile. I'm just going to bring up my slides now, I hope. Uh, it'll take a few seconds. And so while I'm doing that, so while my slides are coming up, uh, so Dispin Agile is, is an extension to Agile. So you've, um, in the previous seminar, you learned about some of the fundamentals. Now I'm going to, you know, take you on the uh, the next step and we'll see, uh, see how that goes. So like I said, uh, this is a, an introduction to uh, Dispin Agile. We'll, uh, we'll work through what that means. Um, okay, so let's get into it. So as you heard, uh, I'm the, uh, the VP and Chief Scientist uh, for Dispin Agile at PMI, along with Mark Lines. I'm one of the co-creators of PMI's Dispin Agile Toolkit, and I'm easy to find on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and all those uh, good social media platforms. So uh, feel free to reach out to me at any point in time. Uh, don't be shy. So in today's talk, uh, what I would like to do is, first of all, I'll give you a brief introduction for what Dispin Agile is. I'll, I'll give you a, a warning. Um, this is a very deep topic, which I'm doing a brief overview of. So um, these slides will be made available to you. Um, and uh, most of this material is on the web at PMI.org anyways. And I'll, I'll share some uh, URLs uh, towards the end of the talk. Uh, we'll get into uh, why Dispin Agile and uh, more importantly into continuous improvement. So how do you get better at getting better? This is the, the fundamental uh, concept behind DA is how do you actually uh, learn how to learn and learn how to improve and do so effectively. So um, what is DA is a fundamental question. So one of the a uh, little bit of problem with the thing. Okay, uh, so Dispin Agile is a toolkit. It's not a framework. And what we mean by that is where frameworks and methods such as Scrum and Safe and Less and others uh, prescribe or tell you what to do, in DA, we tell you what to think about. And I'll um, keep that in mind because I'll, I'll point that out a few slides from now. So 
we teach you what to think about and we give you this uh, searchable and straightforward guidance. So we put um, hundreds of practices and strategies into context uh, because you are unique, your teams are unique, your organizations are unique. So you need to have a fit for purpose way of working. And to do that, you need to be able to choose the right techniques and the right strategies for you in the situation that you face. So where the, the methods and frameworks on the paperwork, you go on mute. Um, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so where their methods and frameworks um, are great starting points, they're not your ending point. Uh, so you might adopt Scrum or Safe or whatever, and that's great, but then you need to tailor it and improve upon it um, to make it you know, your version of Scrum and your version of Safe. So you really want to um, go on that step, and I'm going to show you how to do that. So one of the things that we do in DA is we've extended the... Um, there we go. We've extended the uh, Agile Manifesto and we look beyond the Agile Manifesto. So as you all know, uh, the Manifesto was written a little over 20 years ago now and to address the challenges faced by software development teams in the 90s. Well, since then, we've learned a few things. Uh, we've also expanded the scope of Agile to enterprise agility, not just software agility. So at PMI a couple of years ago now, we stepped back and we asked the question, so based on what we know now, based on the new scope, um, based on the fact that we're dealing with different issues than we were 20 years ago, how would we describe the mindset? And this is what we came up with. So in DA, so remember that this is a, a mindset for business agility or enterprise agility, not just software agility. So we believe in a collection of principles. And because we believe in these principles, we make promises both to ourselves and to the people that we work with, here's how we're gonna behave. Here's how we're gonna collaborate and work together to be effective, to, to move forward together. And in order to fulfill these promises, we follow a collection of guidelines. So what we do is, is this mindset is an enhancement over what you would, you know, and it defines what it is to be agile, to actually uh, be agile outside of software, in, in, within software teams as well, but certainly outside of software teams. And a couple of interesting things about this is it's not technology focused at all. It's also mostly lean uh, because lean is what enables uh, agility at scale and agility uh, in a wide range of situations. There's also some great agile ideas in there as well but it really is uh, an agile and lean uh, type of mindset. So we really want to you know, set a solid foundation for business agility or enterprise agility, depending on what term um, you prefer. So the focus of DA really is enterprise agility. So we've architected the toolkit into four layers. The first layer is the foundation layer. This is where the, you know, the general concepts, the, the foundational concepts are um, for DA. And what's interesting here is you know the mindset is obviously part of it, but we've adopted great ideas from Agile, from Lean, and even from the traditional serial world. So this one Agile is a hybrid uh, because our goal is to help you to make better decisions, to um, you know be a coach in a box basically, and to help you uh, to improve your own way of working. And sometimes uh, the most appropriate way of working uh, for you in your situation is a more of a traditional approach than a Lean approach or than a, than an Agile approach, and that's okay. Do the right thing in the situation that you face. And then, of course, how do you choose your own way of working? And that's a, a big part of the, the conversation today. So building upon the foundation is the discipline DevOps layer. This is enterprise class DevOps. So not only do we, do, do we have software development, you know, discipline agile delivery and IT operations, but how do you weave in security and data management? And how do you weave in your support, your help desk and your release management folks when you have dozens or hundreds of teams in flight, perhaps? Um, and how do, you, how do you make sure that they don't step on each other's feet? Now, if everybody could go on mute, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, building upon DevOps, discipline DevOps, our value streams. So how do we bring products and services to our customers, or in the case of government agencies, to the citizens? Um, how does it all fit together from beginning to end? Building upon that is the discipline agile enterprise. So how do we bring, um, you know, how do we support these value streams? So how do we bring finance and vendor management procurement into, into the picture? How can we help improve on um, human resources, people management, for example? So when we're, 
if you want to be truly agile, if we want to be effective, then the entire organization needs to be improving, needs to be actively getting better. Because if your team is very agile, but you're interacting with teams that are very traditional, it's going to be problematic, right? You need to have a way of working together across multiple teams very often that is effective in practice. Um, so you you really need to look at this bigger picture and how do you you know how do you address that? How do you coach it? How do you how do you manage it? How do you govern it? Um, are all very interesting questions that we we answer in DA. So it's a, a bigger scope than you know the software you know the you know the software development scope that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of agilists like to focus on. Um, and, and obviously software development is important, but it's you know one of many important things that your organization does. So. I like to think of DA as an umbrella over hundreds of practices and strategies. So just like when you go to make your dinner tonight, you'll go to your pantry, you'll go to the kitchen, and you'll, you'll pull ingredients off the shelf and then up a meal for your family. It's the same sort of thing in, in your process, right? You'll pull ideas, you'll pull strategies off the shelf, put them together to form your way of working to address the needs of your team and how you're working together right now and what you need to accomplish right now. And what will happen is just like tomorrow, you'll go to the same pantry and pull different ingredients off the shelf um, and cook it up in a different way for your family tomorrow night because you're not going to eat the same meal every night. Um, it's the same sort of idea in your organization, right? You'll, you know, my, my team will have our way of working that meets our needs. Your team will have your way of working that meets your needs, right? And so on and so on and so on. And then as you know, my situation evolves over time as we learn, I'll change up, the, you know, my team will change up the, our way of working to address, you know, the new situation that we face. Uh, so this is the, the, basic, uh, the basic idea. How do you develop a fit for purpose strategy for your situation? Now, what's interesting is that teams need a fit for purpose approach. One size does not fit all. And but they also need starting points. So, for example, we support what we call uh, life cycles, multiple life cycles. So, we support an agile project life cycle. So, how do you how do you run a you know a project with Scrum from beginning to end, the full picture, not just the little Scrum part of it? How do you do continuous delivery? So, say you're in a in a more of a DevOps type of a situation, but you're still doing agile, you're still doing a, you know, some sort of Scrum based thing. So, we support a continuous delivery agile life cycle. So where the agile project life cycle might deliver once every three months or six months and you know you, you do a project, the, the continuous delivery life cycle, maybe I'm releasing stuff into the marketplace once a week. And you know, every Friday afternoon we release some new stuff. Right? Um, so it's a different, uh, different mindset, different approach, still based on Scrum, but different needs. So these two life cycles are based on Scrum. We support a lean project life cycle based on Kanban and a continuous delivery lean life cycle also based on Kanban. The, now, the big difference there, um, particularly continuous delivery lean, this is, you know, in many ways, you know, pure DevOps, you know, for, the, for those of you who are on software uh, teams, this is more of a pure DevOps type of mindset where, where I might be releasing a production several times a day. Right. So, big, you know, you know, very different than releasing once a quarter or once, you know, once or once a year. Um, that I would be on a project team, perhaps. So those are both based on Kanban. Now, the first, uh, the top two life cycles are project life cycles. The bottom two life cycles are product or service team life cycles for long-standing teams. So not everything's a project, and that's okay. Uh, but some interesting implications there for your government strategy, which we'll talk about in a bit. We also support an exploratory life cycle based on lean startup. So what do you do when you have a, a new, you know, you want to bring a new product to market? So you've got an idea. To de-risk that, you follow this exploratory approach where, where you create some, you know, MVPs and we run some experiments in the marketplace to find out what our what our customers actually want. That's all based on lean startup. We have a program life cycle for a, you know, a team of teams or, you know, an initiative of initiatives where the sub teams are doing whatever it is that they're doing. They may or may not be project teams. They may or may not be agile. They may or may not be lean. Um, could be a combination thereof. But how do you coordinate across this sort of a situation? At some point in the future, um, hopefully soon, we'll support uh, explicitly support a serial life cycle. We've already got a, uh, a fair bit of serial material or traditional material, predictive, whatever term you like there, 
um, uh, material already um, in the foundation, but how, you know, uh, we'll soon be adding an explicit serialized cycle and of course support for uh, PMI citizen development as well. And we already have uh, citizen development support in the toolkit, uh, but just not an explicit life cycle yet. So the point is different teams are in different situations and they will choose a different life cycle as a starting point to form their way of working. That's the, the fundamental idea here. And of course, you need to govern all of this. So it, it, it's at, usually at this point in the presentation, the you know this, the executives start to get a bit worried because it's, what do you mean all the teams will be working in different ways and they have their fit for purpose approach? I have to lead, I have to govern, I got to keep an eye on these folks. Should I not be enforcing the same way of working on everybody? And the answer is no, uh, you know, uh, because what'll happen is one way of working um, sounds great from a management point of view, perhaps, but it's not going to make sense for most of your teams because different people in different situations. Like a team of five works very differently than a team of 50 than a team of 500. A team in a regulatory environment will work very differently than a team in a non-regulatory environment and so on. Right? Uh, so we need, to, we need to be flexible. So how do we do that? Well, governance is baked right into Dispin Agile. So where governance tends to be a swear word for a lot of Agilists, in Dispin Agile, our approach is, you know, let's be, you know, let's get real. You are being governed. You deserve to be governed well. So how do you do that? So instead of having a more traditional approach to governance based on, uh, you know, reviews and common templates and common artifacts, we instead promote a risk-based approach. So as long as the teams are addressing common risks and doing so in an appropriate manner for them, that's great. Um, and this actually reflects uh, the PMI's uh, risk management or uh, risk management and governance uh, standards as well, if you if you um, are familiar with them at all. So let's have a, a lightweight yet sufficient approach to governance, which is flexible enough to be tailored to different situations to allow the teams to have a fit for purpose approach. So to support team agility, because once again, you know, so remember earlier I was talking about how we don't tell you what to do, we tell you what to think about. So in DA, we describe team level agility as a collection of process goals, what we call process goals. So the idea here is at a very high level, your team needs to, needs to address these goals. So for example, at the beginning, I need to form the team. I'm, you know, my team needs to form itself somehow. We need to explore scope. You know, what, what are we working on? What are we gonna produce? We probably need to explore the architecture. How are we going to build this? How are we going to address this problem space? Uh, we need to uh, secure funding for the effort. You know, somebody's got to pay for all this. Right? Uh, throughout construction, you know, I should be producing a potentially consumable solution. Our term for potentially shippable software, if you're familiar with Scrum. We should be improving quality as we go. We should be accelerating value delivery. We should be focused on how can we get better um, through various techniques at bringing real value to our customers. Um, throughout all this, you know, I should be measuring. I should be, you know, organizing measures and you know, measuring my outcomes. We should be addressing risk. We should be coordinating activities both within the team and with other teams and so on, right? And there's different ways we can do all these things and I'll dive into some details in a second, but we should be addressing this stuff at a reason, and it's, and it's all high level stuff, but um, it needs to be done. The methods will tell you specific ways of doing this. But is that a good way? So for example, you know, earlier I was talking about how you're gonna make dinner tonight. Well, I could give you a recipe right now for making um, you know, chicken cacciatore. Is that the right meal for your family? I don't, I don't know anything about your family, but I could definitely prescribe a, a recipe for that. Is, it, is that a good option? No idea, right? No. Do you even have the ingredients at home for that? Don't know, right? But a recipe would prescribe that. So that's the difference. So let's dive down to some details. So this is a, what we call a process goal diagram, in this case, for planning the release. So some initial planning up front, right? Because, uh, you know, effective teams um, plan, uh, I would hope. So anyways, the process goal is this rounded rectangle. The decision point, uh, we've got something called decision points. So remember how I said, we tell you what to think about. Well, that's what the decision points are all about. So when you're, planning the release, these square rectangles are all issues that you really need to think about 
and address somehow when you're uh, doing planning stuff. The then to the to the right of the decision points are lists of options because there's multiple ways you can do anything. So for example, here, there's multiple ways that we can capture the plan. So we've li we have a list of options. In behind all these options, we'll see, we'll see some details in a minute, are descriptions and trade-offs. So is this option right for you? Because you might not be an expert at all of these different techniques. Fair enough, nobody expects you to be. That would be naive, but you still want to choose the right one for you. So what we're doing in DA is we're gonna give you enough information to choose the right strategy for you in the situation that you face. You can also see that some of these options are highlighted. So those are called suggested options. So if you happen to be in a st really straightforward situation, then the suggestions are probably about 95% correct because some people just wanna be told what to do. You know, give me a starting point, tell me what to do. You know, let's get on with it. I don't wanna, I don't wanna have to make choices. So fair enough, it's just like, you know, you can go to a fast food restaurant and say, you know, give me meal deal number seven. And you know they'll feed you that. Um, some people want to do that. Fair enough. So there's suggested options. The some of the lists have an arrow beside the list. That's what we call an ordered list. And what we mean by that is the strategies towards the top of the list are generally more effective in no, practice than the strategies towards the bottom of the list. The time, no. If everybody could go on mute, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, then there's some lists without arrows and those are unordered lists so we can tell you that the trade-offs involved with each of these strategies we just can't say that strategy you know strategy a is generally better than strategy b because um, it really depends on your situation so sometimes you have uh, advice for how we can improve because um, you know work your way up the list type of a strategy sometimes it's just here's a bunch of good choices you choose what's most appropriate for you right now in your situation so assuming that you're not an expert at all those techniques on that previous slide, I, like I said, I, I'm not an expert at them, um, let alone anybody else. So where do you go for the details? So this is a screenshot from a tool called the DA browser. This is available free of charge to you from PMI.org. You can see the you can see the URL there. And, and don't, don't worry, um, you know, like I said, we're going to give uh, a, co a PDF of all these slides out afterwards, so you don't have to madly write all this stuff down. Um, but anyways, so you can start diving down in the details. So what's happened here is I've clicked on one of the options in that previous gold diagram we saw on the previous slide, because I don't know anything about it, but it sounds interesting. So for each of these options, there's a description. Um, these ones are a little brief, but usually it's paragraph. Like these are almost, because they're straightforward options, so one sentence is getting the job done. Um, but there's a brief description. There's also a list of trade-offs. There's no such thing as a best practice, regardless of any marketing you might have heard otherwise. Um, all practices are contextual in nature. They work well in some situations and they're a bad idea in others. So you need to choose what's right for you. So we put them into context. We tell you, here's the, here's the, here's the trade-offs of this, of this strategy. You choose what's right for you. What, what set of risks are you, are you willing to live with? Now, if this information is not enough, um, and you know it might not be, if you're totally brand new to this, then yeah, there's certainly not enough, enough information there. So we take it down one level further and we provide de detailed resources. And it's almost always articles, sometimes books, uh, sometimes videos, um, but it's usually like a blog posting or a, uh, some sort of you know, detailed article on that technique. Um, so that way you can get up to speed on uh, you know, on whatever it is so you can continue to you know dive down the level of detail that you need um, to make a good decision about what uh, what to experiment with what to potentially adopt so sounds pretty complicated why would you want to do this fair enough good question so why da well i like why not just adopt scrum why not just adopt safe so like i said they're good starting points but might not be an ending point. So how effective are these frameworks in practice? That's a, that's a fair question. And there's wonderful marketing rhetoric coming from all the framework people telling you how awesome they, their things are, 10 times productivity, do, do twice the work and half the time. Great marketing, good for them. What's the reality on the ground is a fair question. So can I get some hard data on this? So what actually happens in practice? So when you go to adopt 
a new framework, a new method, regardless of what it is, um, there's an initial learning curve. You got to get some training. You, you got to start figuring it out, you know, apply it in your situation, right? Make it work for you. So your effectiveness goes down for a bit. But assuming you're successful and, you know, and you've chosen the right method to address whatever problem you've got, um, your effectiveness goes up because there's value in these frameworks, right? Um, so you solve the problem by applying the method to, that addresses that problem. But then eventually you hit the limits of the framework, right? Like Scrum solves a certain problem. Once you've adopted it successfully, well, you solve the problem. Safe solves a certain problem and so on, right? So you end up, in, so Ivar Yakuzin a few years ago wrote, wrote an article saying that once you adopt these methods and frameworks, you end up in, in framework prison or, or method jail um, because you hit the limits of the framework. And they, they wave their hands and they say, yes, you can, um, you know, you can improve, you can do anything you want in Scrum and you can, you can tailor it. And, it. and that's absolutely true, but they don't give you any advice for how to do that. DA is the advice. So, but a valid question is, is what is that level? Um, you know, where, where are we going to peak out at? You know, what value are we actually getting from adopting these methods? And the good news is that, yeah, you know, we're seeing like a seven, 12, seven to 12% productivity improvement uh, on average. So, it's not the you know not not the ten times um, improvement you may you might have been promised, but seven to twelve percent is not bad. That's pretty good. Um, so um, you know, like I said, you know, these are good starting points, but unfortunately they're not your ending point. You really want to get good at it. At, at, you want to get better at getting better. You want to learn how to improve and learn how to constantly improve. So the next valid question here is if the frameworks aren't delivering on the promises that they're being, that they're making, I, and it's clear benefit here, don't get me wrong, but if they're not giving you the magic silver bullet uh, that you're being promised, what do you do? Well, my advice is, why don't you look at the, why don't you look at the really good companies out there? What organizations would you be scared to have to compete against? Or who do you admire? Who are the apex level predators in your, in your marketplace? And what I mean by that is like the Apples and the Amazons of the world, the Alibabas, the Googles, these really hyper competitive, hyper effective companies that, you know, you're, in, you know, if Amazon decides to get into your market, you've probably got a serious problem. What are those people doing? Because shouldn't we start, you know, what, don't you want to be the next Amazon? Wouldn't that be nice? So do you think they're copying somebody else's way of working? No, they're not, right? All of them. What's interesting, if you read case studies and books about these companies, they all do the same thing. They all follow a continuous improvement process where they choose to be responsible for evolving their own way of working. They're constantly improving. They're constantly getting better. So they're following a process that looks like this. And this is a, a you know, this is called Kaizen, um, you know, it comes with a, a bunch of different names like PDSA or PDCA. But the basic idea is you improve in small steps. Um, this is a you know common lean concept from the 80s actually, uh, probably earlier than that to be fair, but certainly uh, was popularized in the 80s. So they identify an issue. They say, hey, we need to improve this. Then they they say, well, you know, how can we improve it? You know, what what are you know what are you know one or more things um, that we could potentially do to solve whatever this problem is? Like you know, we want to improve the way that we're approaching testing. We want to improve the way we're delivering things into the marketplace. We want to improve the way that we make ice cream and sell ice cream to our customers, you know, whatever the, whatever the challenge is, right? Then they try the techniques out. They, they run experiments, you know, let's try a new way of working out and see if it works. And they, they, and they measure, right? So that, that's a critical thing. So they assess how well this new way of working actually work out for us in our situation. And if it worked out, they adopt it because it's a better way of working. So you adopt it. If it didn't work out, they abandon it. It was a failed experiment. You know, hey, we tried, didn't work out. It sounded like a good idea. It didn't work out for us. Fair enough. Then they share their learnings. Hopefully, <laughs> they share their learnings with others. Um, so that way, maybe other, other, other people in your company or, you know, outside of the company could potentially benefit from, you know, whatever it is that you just learned. So that's called continuous improvement. Like I said, you know, um, you know, this might be called you know, plan, do, study, act, you know, Deming's approach or plan, do, check, act, depending on which version of Deming's uh, work you look at, um, but very, very common. So that's a wonderful story. 
Next question would be, well, how well does this work out? Well, if you if you look at the, you know, the once again, the apex predators, the companies that have been doing this for a long, long time, like how did Amazon get as good as they are? Are they special? Is it magic? No, they've just been on the continuous improvement path for, you know, a couple decades now. They've learned how to learn. They are a learning organization. So they enjoy an improvement curve that looks like this. It just keeps going up. Um, and it's interesting when you read about these companies, when you or talk with them, if you get if you get a chance to do that, um, their stories are all the same. And what's also interesting is they're still improving. They're deathly afraid of somebody catching up to them and out competing them. So they've been improving for years and they continue to improve even today because they built it right into their culture. They've learned how to learn. That's a critical observation. So. Next question would be, well, OK, you know, Scott, you just spun a really nice story. Sort of sounds like the, you know, you know, do twice the work and half the time stuff that other people have spun. What actually happens in practice? Good question. Fair enough. So going through this process, well, you know, you, you, you run an experiment and you fail. Hopefully you're failing fast and um, I'm sure you've heard and we'll, we'll talk about failing fast versus failing stuff. Yeah, let's talk about it now. So. The idea is what you want to do, run an experiment, run a small experiment really quickly, and hopefully either succeed really quickly or fail really quickly. Yeah, you know, so you want to fail fast rather than failing slowly, which is, well, slow, time consuming and expensive. So let's fail quickly and cheaply if we're going to fail. So anyways, you know, we failed. So we try again and we fail again and we try again. So you fail again, you try again. Oh, this time we succeeded. We guessed right. Our experiment ran, and that's good. And so we adopt it, and that's typically what we share. We share our, you know, our successes, maybe not, maybe not our failures as often as we probably should, uh, but that's that's the way it plays out. And that's fine, right? And this is what a lot of the agile coaches will tell you to do: is fail fast, run experiments, all these good sorts of things. Challenge with this, of course, is that that's really good if you're being paid to do this. What happens if you're the person paying the bills? You look at this sort of a picture, and this is typical, and you think, well, wait a minute, we're, I don't want to pay for all these failures. This is crazy. Why are we failing? Why shouldn't we be succeeding? Um, so this message really falls flat um, pretty quickly in a lot of organizations. So can we do better? Can we improve upon the continuous improvement strategy? And the answer, of course, is yes. So how do we do that? Well, when you look at this process, the problem is in the third step, at least that's where the symptom is. So some of our experiments fail and you're only human. So fair enough. But and, and you know, the, the consultants will spin this. Well, it's not really a failure because you've learned something. You've learned what doesn't work. I absolutely agree with that. Fair enough. But it still falls flat if you're the person paying the bills. Right. So we, we also got to got to be fair. Got to recognize that. So it's not really getting you closer to this improvement goal that you've got. Right. At least now you know what doesn't work. And you can move on to something else, but still, could we have been smarter about this? So failing fast is fine. You know, if you're going to fail, you might as well fail fast. That's a good thing. Um, but can we succeed earlier? Can we reduce the number of failures? Can we be smarter about what we're doing? And to do that, we really need to fix the second step. So if we can get better at identifying what we need to experiment with or what we want to experiment with, we can reduce the number of failures because this is a simple numbers game now. So how do you do that? Well, you hire an expensive coach, right? That's what everybody tells you to do. Um, and fair enough, I'm a firm believer in coaching. Uh, but can you attract these people? Are, you know, can you get a good coach? Do you even know what a good coach is? Um, you know, there, there, there's a few challenges here. Can you retain them? Um, you might be able to hire a good coach, but do they have experience in the problems that you're that you're facing now and will face in the future? Right? Do they do they have the background? And they might, um, you know, without a doubt, um, or maybe they, maybe they're making things up, right? So, a bit of an issue there. But I'm a firm believer in coaching. Don't get me wrong. Another strategy which works phenomenally well with coaching is if you've got a process knowledge base, such as the Disponential Toolkit, such as the type you know, the type of thing we saw earlier, and you know how to navigate it and apply it, then you can start making better decisions. So you can you can fail less often. Uh, and because you fail less often, you succeed faster and cheaper. 
And this is all based on the observation that more than likely the problems that you that your teams are facing today are problems that have already been a, uh, faced and addressed successfully by hundreds or thousands of people before you. So if you have the humility to recognize that, then you can leverage the learnings of others if you have access to those learnings. And the DA Toolkit gives you that access. We call this guided continuous improvement. So it's an improvement on the improvement on the continuous improvement process. So earlier we saw that adopting a framework or a method gives you a, a an improvement curve that looks like this. And this is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. This is good. You, you're seeing improvement. That's a good assuming you're su you successfully adopted framework. Um, you're seeing good improvement. That, that's a that's a wonderful thing. I highly suggest it. But it's only a starting point. If we can learn to do, if you start doing continuous improvement, either from the original starting point or the new starting point that you're at, then you enjoy an improvement curve like the Amazons of the world. If you take a guided continuous improvement approach, the curve is steeper because you're having fewer failures. And this is what DA is all about. So our philosophy is to start where you are. So if you're currently brand new to Agile, great, that's your starting point. DA can help you there. If you're currently doing Scrum or Safe, great. That's your starting point. You've probably, you've, obviously, you've solved a few problems already, but now you're, you know, now you're looking to move on to improve from whatever it is you're currently doing. Great, DA can help you with that. So start where you are. Do the best that you can in the situation that you face, and you're professionals. I know you're doing that already. I, I, I don't, even, I shouldn't even be telling you that. Um, but anyways, but always strive to get better, and that's the secret sauce of the apex predators, the Amazons, the Apples, the Googles of the world. They know that they have to be always getting better. Otherwise, somebody will catch up to them and surpass them. And then they've got a very serious problem. So how would you, you know, why would you want to do this? Where would you, you know, where would you possibly apply this in your organization? Well, obviously, at the team level, there's great opportunity. To, like, any team can always get better. My team can get better. And we're pretty darn good at what we do. But we can always get better. And so can your team, too. And you're pretty darn good, too. We can improve across teams. So my team might have to work with finance in order to get money. Fair enough, right? So can we improve the relationship with finance? We're probably part of an overall value stream. So my team is part of the overall flow uh, of, uh, you know, the overall workflow, overall process flow within the company. Can we improve the overall flow to get more effective at doing whatever it is that we do? Fair enough. So can we? Can we uh, coach across, you know, multiple team, multiple disparate teams at once? So in practice, there's a few challenges here. So even though the Agile community is pretty darn good at adopt at at uh, coaching at the team level, particularly in the software world, um, a lot of organizations find a, a glass barrier to Agile adoption. The Agile stuff is not getting out of the software folks like great for the software teams but the coaches really struggle for the most part when they go to coach the procurement team or the finance team or the the security team and so on right because they just don't have that background worse yet uh, are transformations uh, the average agile trans transformations in general like digital transformations or agile transformations run a, a, a failure rate of between 70 and 80 percent um, and that's because of organizational antibodies, your existing culture, people just having different views. Uh, it's really, really hard to pull this off. And often it's because the people who are trying to do the transformations don't have the experience, don't have the background to, to pull it off. And it's hard. It's really, really hard. It's a multi-year thing. Um, it's pretty brutal. So DA can help with that. So how do we do that? Well, at the team level, you need a team coach. Right, somebody that can you know help with the team and you know help you know you know help uh, help them improve and all that good sort of stuff. But to improve across teams, you really need somebody with you know several years of experience, you know a, more of a senior coach type of person who who understands the nuances of well, here's what the finance team does, and here's what the 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 procurement team does, and here's what the software team does, and we're going to get all three of these to negotiate a potential change between them to improve the way that they work together. Because otherwise, um, you know, we got a problem, right? You know, procurement's taking too long or finance doesn't want to fund things. You know, whatever the challenge happens to be. And I'm going to walk through some examples of all this, by the way. 
Um, and then finally, at the enterprise level, we need we need enterprise coaches or value stream consultants, people who can look at the bigger picture and and help us with these you know, reasonably hard negotiations across disparate teams, which have very different priorities and very different views of, of the way the world works sometimes. But yet we still need to make it work because we're all part of a bigger organization. So let's walk through an example. So how would you how would you how would you apply the DE toolkit at the team level? So here we've got a situation where you know my you know I'm coaching a team and we're a product team and we're bringing teddy bears to market. We we produce and we sell teddy bears, and our customers love us. Like you know all these little kids, they love our teddy bears, and we bring out new teddy bears and with different functionality and clothing for the teddy bears and you know whatever you do to to do bring teddy bears to market. I'm not I'm not a teddy bear expert, but that's what we do. <laughs> so anyways, we're bringing teddy bears to market. Problem we've got though, is we're not growing the business. So our existing customers love us. We bring a new teddy bear out, everybody buys it, um, but we're not adding new customers. So it's the same group of kids buying our teddy bears. Um, so that's a bit of a problem for us, right? Because we want to grow the market. We've also got the problem that, you know, once these kids get older, they're gonna stop buying teddy bears probably. So a um, few issues here. So what do we do? We've got a great product owner on the team. She really knows her stuff. She, so she really understands the existing customers, but doesn't understand the potential customers at all. So these epics and user stories she's writing, just not getting the job done, unfortunately. So what do we do? So let's apply the toolkit. Oh, and unfortunately on my team, I don't have a, a business analysis expert on the team that could just say, oh yeah, we need to do X, Y, Z. Right? We, don't have, we don't have that expertise on the team, unfortunately, for whatever reason. So we go to the toolkit and we realize, you know what, we've got a problem with the way that we explore scope. So let's dive down. So we go to the explore scope diagram. We start looking around a bit. So luckily on the team, we do have a, a, a coach that's been trained in DA. So we, they know how to navigate the toolkit. They're not an expert at like the 1600 practices in the toolkit, but they know how to find information. They've learned how to navigate the toolkit. So we look at the, we look at the goal diagram. We then look at the decision points and we realize, you know what? Sounds like we've got a problem with the way we explore usage. We understand how the existing customers want to use our teddy bears. We don't have a clue how non-customers want to use our teddy bears. That seems to be where our problem is. Now, once again, if I had a, had a, somebody with deep business analysis experience, this checklist is probably enough to say, oh yeah, I remember. A few years ago, we used this technique on this other team where, where we had a similar problem. It worked really well, let's do that. Sadly, we don't have that expertise. So we dive down to the next level of detail. We do a little bit of reading using the, the DA browser. Um, so in this case, we, you know, so we go looking around at some of these techniques. Um, now I'm not listing all the techniques. We've got a screen screen real estate problem here, but you know if this was the actual tool, you could scroll down and see all the great gory details. And as you can see, you know all these techniques have a paragraph or two, um, descriptions, bunch of trade-offs. Um, and we so we do a little bit of reading, and we say, you know what, sounds like personas are the way to go. Now, if this was the tool, and if I didn't have any persona experience, I would click on additional resources and up would come two or three articles on the topic and then we would dive down, but we're not gonna show that. So anyways, what we've done is we've home, reasonably quickly homed in on a technique that has a reasonably high probability of solving the actual problem that we have. So we've made a better decision of, of a technique to experiment with. Chances are pretty good we're gonna succeed. Now. We, you were only human, we could still make mistakes, but chance, you know, we've increased our probability of not making a mistake. Let's do a slightly more complex uh, problem. So here we have my team, the teddy bear team, and we need to get funding uh, for our next, our, our next round, our next release. So our, the finance folks have come to us and said, you know what, your funding's about to run out, you're at the end of, end of the current project. Um, we need to create a business case, a plan, estimates, all that sort of stuff. We'll review it. And uh, if we like what we hear, we'll give you funding for the next six months. So, but we're agile, of course. So we said, wait, wait a minute. No, 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 that's what a waste of time. That's useless overhead. What's wrong with you? Just give us funding. Should be time materials funding. You know, we're agile, we're smarter than you. You know, shut up and do what you're told. That message doesn't fly well <laughs> with the finance people for some strange reason. And they come back to us and they say, well, wait a minute. No, this is our standard way of working. Um, you know, we, we, you know, this is a standard, you know, management approach. This is what we're going to do. We've tried time materials before in the past, 
didn't work out for us. Too risky to do time materials. Um, so, you know, do the business case thing, do what you're told. And that's a problem, right? So here we've got two different teams, my agile team, which wants to work in a more effective manner, the finance team telling us, no, 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 we've got to do this. So what do we do? Well, once again, go back to the toolkit. So now we've got a challenge. Now our issue is how, how does my team secure funding? And we look at this goal diagram and we realize, well, wait a minute. Here's the approach that we're taking. We're doing a, like a, this fixed price um, project based approach. And there's a reasonably formal request process. So we look at the techniques that we're currently following and they're all pretty much at the bottom of the list um, on these ordered uh, on these ordered lists. And unfortunately, so we got a problem now. Unfortunately, once again, we don't have a finance expert on the team. So all we would do is, you know, at that at that level, all we're going to do is whine about how 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 hard our life is and how the finance people don't know what they're doing. And, you know, you know, whoa, ho, you know, woo, hoo, woe is us. Right. Um, and we should really be doing time materials, but unfortunately they don't want to listen to us. So we're done. No, what we should do is have an intelligent conversation with finance. So we go into the toolkit. We do a little bit of reading. We find out about the techniques that they want to follow. And, and rightfully so, right? They have their priorities. They know they're, they're finance experts. They know what they're doing. They believe in what, what they're asking you to do. Um, but there's some challenges here, right? There's advantages to that those strategies, and there's some disadvantages as well. And we're suffering from a lot of the disadvantages. So what we want to do is have an intelligent conversation with them we want, to, we want to understand the benefits that they're probably focused on, and we want to have a good conversation about some of the disadvantages that we're currently experiencing that they might not be aware of. Right? We also look at the at the diagram. We say, wait a minute, there's four different strategies that are better than the one we're currently doing. Maybe we should try one of those. So go back to toolkit again, and here we're looking at two of them again. Once again, screen screen real estate challenges. And we realize, well, hey, for time materials, here's the advantages and disadvantages. For the stage gate approach, here's some advantages and disadvantages. Now, normally, I would probably go with, I would probably push time materials. And this is usually the standard go-to strategy for all the scrum coaches out there, because it's probably the only strategy they know. So, of course, they're going to suggest the only thing they know. But that's a non-starter at this company. They've already failed several times at time materials, so we're not going to do it again. So. What we can do is say, in this situation, an improvement over our current approach might not be the best way of working, but it's certainly the best we can do right now, hopefully, is stage gate. So we can pitch that to the, fun the finance team and say, well, wait a minute, why don't we experiment with this? And just my team and you will experiment with this, not, not the 50 other teams that you also are funding, but just my team. So it's a low risk experiment. We'll try it out on this release and we'll see if it works, we'll learn. We'll learn if it works for us in our situation. So now that's a coherent conversation. Chances are reasonably good they're going to go for it. Hopefully it's going to work out for you. And if it does, well, you've improved things. That's good. And because you've already had a success at improving this, maybe the next time you can talk them into experimenting with time materials because now you're you, they can trust you. They, you you've had a success. Right, this is good. Um, certainly, we're not going to fail at time materials again. Right, we can avoid another failure, so we can be smart about this. We can succeed early. So, one more example, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap up here. So, what about improving across the organization or improving across a value stream? So, this diagram here in the corner is the the process flow um, for a for a value stream. So, in this situation, what our issue is is the the PMO has come to us and they said, well, wait a minute. We need to release new offerings to market faster. We need to generate you know, revenue quicker. That's a good idea. The product management folks, they say, yeah, we love this. This is a great idea. We should start, instead of doing big projects, we should be releasing small little chunks of functionality, these minimum business increments, to get value into the hands of our customers sooner. It's lower risk, faster to do. Customers you have been asking for something like this. It makes us more competitive. And the PMO says, no, 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 no. We, we fund projects. We don't fund features here. The release management people, they say, we'd love to do this. Having quicker releases of smaller things is lower risk for us. Um, this is a good thing. This would make our lives a lot easier. Uh, sadly, though, the data people, 
they can't handle uh, they can't handle the changes very well. Um, it takes them three months to make any changes. Data management people come back and they say, well, no, no, data is different. Rules don't apply to us. Um, it can't possibly be agile. That's totally false, but that's what they believe. And the PMO comes back with, but well, wait a minute, we need to release new offerings to market faster. So we've gone full circle here. So now we have multiple teams here with very different views of what they can do, different belief systems, and we still need to negotiate a change across, you know, an experiment to make a potential change across these teams. Okay. And then once again, you would apply, I'm not going to go into the details, but you would apply the toolkit to do that too. And this is what a, like a, a senior value stream consultant or enterprise coach would do. So how do you learn more about this stuff? How do you, how do you actually gain these skills? So as you know, I hope uh, PMI is all about helping you to work smarter, helping you to become change makers, to drive the change that you want to be. And DA, uh, the toolkit, um, once you learn how to apply it, um, can be a, a part of that overall solution. Uh, and, and frankly, it's a fundamental career skill um, that will last for decades as well. So successful organizations take responsibility for their way of working. They're learning organizations. So, for example, Spotify, they don't follow what you know is the Spotify method. The real Spotify method is to do continuous improvement, like I've been talking about. Um, so they, you know, so what you want to do is become a Spotify that does continuous improvement. You don't want to copy their their way of working from ten years ago now. Um, so that's the that's the main difference. So start where you are, do the best that you can, and always strive to improve. So we have several uh, courses and certifications around this in DA. The Discipline Agile Scrum Master Cert will teach you the the fundamentals of DA. Will get you going. So if you're if you're new to Agile. This is a great cert, and it goes far beyond being a Scrum Master, so it's a bit misnamed, unfortunately. Um, the Discipline Agile Senior Scrum Master is teaching you fundamental uh, skills that are required of a team coach. Um, so this is all uh, this is all a very good thing. The Discipline Agile Coach is really giving you senior coaching experience, and also requires several years of Agile experience. So it's not something that you can you can start off at right away. Um, and the value stream consultant is giving you this higher level. How do I coach across multiple teams? How do I improve the overall way of help facilitate the improvement of of, uh, of the overall process? So anyways, um, hopefully we've got time for some questions. I hope you've been uh, uh, typing things in the chat. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, take take a, take some time for a few questions. Wow. Thanks a lot, Scott. That was really, really enlightening. Um, I know there, for me, I, I, I have questions, but I'm, I'm going to take it personally with you maybe after this. Uh, <laughs> but I'm sure every one of us really got a lot. I can see everybody was really focused. Um, everybody paid attention and we still had everybody kept here on the group during your presentation. Thank you so much for that well enlightening presentation, Scott. Very nice. So um, we have um, less than 15 minutes for our Q&A. Um, so I'm going to take some of the questions we have. Um, before I share the ones we have on the group, let me share um, the ones we received earlier on. First of all, what are the success factors for DA? Yeah, so it, um, the main success factors are, you know, do you want to improve? Because um, there, there's a big difference between, you know, I just want to adopt Scrum. I just want to adopt Safe, and I want to learn how to get better at getting better. And um, so, you know, the, you know, there is a little bit of training, just like everything else. You you got to get a little bit of training. But then it it becomes an issue of the people that you're working with. Do they want to improve? So if I'm a if I'm a team lead, I'm a project manager, or I'm, I'm in a coaching position. Um, you know, do they want to get better? Do they want to improve? And most people do, right? It's you know, it's it's just you're right, you've got problems at work, you want to fix them. But also, you know, I just want to improve, you know, I want to flesh up my resume, call it like it is. <laughs> so, um, you know, can I learn more skills? Can I get better at what I'm doing? And um, this is really, so are you working with people that want to improve is probably the, the key success factor there. Okay. So secondly, what could we put in place to increase our chances to have people at top DA or in our regions in Africa? Yeah, so I think the, the the main issue there is one of 
um, can you can your organization perceive that they want to be a learning organization? So, you know, are you is your goal to be, you know, to do whatever it is you're doing, or do you want to be the next Amazon? Do you want to be the next Apple? Do you, do you want to be, you know, the number one company or number one organization in 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 your field in your area? And the only way you're going to be able to do that is through continuous improvement, um, because you've got to get better. Like, even if you were to to adopt. Um, you know, the perfect framework for you, for your situation today and do it successfully. Um, at best, all you're doing is copying somebody else's way of working. So they're already ahead of you to begin with. Um, so you're never going to catch up to them. And then, but even if you did, it wouldn't matter because if they're improving and, and you're not, then, you know, f they're just going to keep getting ahead, you know, further and further ahead of you. So it's a critical, it's, it's like as a professional, I have, you know, in order to stay ahead, I've got to be constantly learning. I personally have to be constantly picking up new skills and new ways of thinking. Um, your team and your organization has to have the exact same mindset. Um, otherwise, you will be outcompeted by organizations that have a learning mindset, um, and that's really what it gets down to. So, so does your does your organization want truly want to improve? And that means you need to build up the behaviors and the skills to do improvement. Um, and that's what DA teaches you. And, and, and the frameworks don't. They, the frameworks um, teach you, you know, Scrum teaches you how to be good at Scrum. Safe teaches you how to be good at Safe. And that's those are all good things, but it, they're not teaching you how to, how to continuously improve and continuously get better. Okay. Then how can we guide management during the adoption or implementation? Yeah, so... Um, it's you know it it almost always starts with a little bit of education. They they need to um, come up to speed on what this DA thing is. You know what you know why would you want to become a learning organization? Um, they might not even know that they need to do this, uh, or some will and some won't. Is usually the situation. So you need to communicate what DA is and and uh, and how to and and why you want to do it. And that's something that we teach the you know, the value stream consultants and the coaches. Um, you know you know this 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 sort of thing gets taught there. Um, and then you need to start executing. You need to start training your teams on DA. You know, start uh, putting them in a position where they can where they can choose their own way of working and be, you know be allowed to experiment, be allowed to um, you know you know, have a fit for purpose approach, um, be allowed to improve. Like it seems strange that I have to say I have to allow you to improve, um, but in a lot of organizations, I got to get permission uh, to work better. Uh, it's really yeah. it's really sort of unfortunate that way. Um, so, yeah, so the executives need to understand that they need to enable their teams to actually be effective. OK, OK, thanks. Um, OK, we also have a question from Tim Lulu in um, from MTN Nigeria. And um, the question here is, um, what's the main difference between guided continuous improvement and continuous improvement? She seems not to be very clear about that. Yeah. So, so guided continuous improvement is an improvement over 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 continuous improvement. And so, the basic idea is that instead of in continuous improvement, you're you're left on your own, right? Like it's that that identifying you know potential way to fix this problem is you know left up to you. Like so, if you've got good people on your team with deep experience, then yes, you can probably identify what you need to do, um, hopefully. But if you don't have that. Um, and you certainly won't have that in all of the problem space um, that you face, right? Because you're you're in a complex environment, right? You you got to worry how how am I funding my team? How am I guiding it? How am I measuring it? How am I approaching testing and validation? How am I a, approaching um, architecture? How am I approaching requirements? How am I approaching this this and this? If you remember that one chart with all the little bubbles on it? There's 24 bubbles there. I got to address all those things. Um, so do I have that level of expertise? Uh, across my team. If I do, great, uh -huh, I'm good to go. But chances are pretty good I don't. So, but yet you still have to fix the problem. So, like that problem that that example I walked through with the the teddy bear, uh, the teddy bear team. If they had no background in requirements, it's completely naive to expect them to come up with a a, a valid thing technique to experiment with without a heck of a lot of work invest, you know, uh, researching and investigating or just randomly stumbling into something um, to, to experiment with, right? As opposed to, oh, wait a minute, here's this list of techniques. Like there's like uh, 10 techniques in that list or whatever it was, right? Um, you're not going to know all 10, all 10 of those techniques. 
He just won't. So how the heck can you, uh, if, unless you get really lucky, you're never going to guess uh, one of the better ones to address the, you know, address the thing, unless you have somebody on the team with experience. But if you don't, but you know what, even if you did, then I'll just, you know, then, you know, as soon as you run into an architecture problem or a testing problem or a finance problem, you're not going to have expertise in all of those things. So eventually you're going to stumble into issues that you just don't know what you're doing. Um, so the DA toolkit helps you to, to give you the background that you don't have. Fair enough. Okay. Right. So okay. um, also from her, she said, um, is the DA toolkit, DA toolkit in, in itself, not a framework? Is it a framework, not a framework? Yeah, it's it's a toolkit. Like, you know, we we give, you know, we give we don't prescribe things. Like that's the big difference. So, you know, we give you suggestions. Hey, you really need to think about this. Um, and here's some good options. And and we give you starting points as well, right? So we're not just, you know, throwing you to the wolves. But um we, you know, we do it, it it's more advanced than the frameworks and methods. It's it, it's really giving you the because we're we're addressing a, a totally different skill set. It's you know, how do you how do you improve? How do you get better at getting better? Um, whereas the, 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 the frameworks are addressing the issue of how do I work in this exact way that we, we have declared to be a best practice. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a different, uh, yeah. And like I said, like this is truly a, a career, you know, this is something you're, you know, these are skills you'll be able to use your entire career. Um, because mm -hmm. I just can't yeah. imagine being in a situation where I'm not going to want to improve. I'm not going to want to learn and get better. Um, so this is something you need for your your overall career success. Okay, all right, thanks, God. And um, Margo also asked. Um, it seems the toolkit is also evolving at version 5.5 now. What can we expect to see in the toolkits in the nearest future? Um, the future? Yeah, so great. Well, you can expect 5.6 to be released on June 30th. Um, we released once a quarter. Um, last Thursday of the quarter, basically, is our is our overall game plan. And uh, you know, so we're we're always adding uh, techniques, uh, more references, more um, we're fleshing out parts of the toolkit that um, you know need to be fleshed out. So it's just more um, is usually and updates, of course. So, you know, we're you know every so often we fix spelling mistakes and things like that. But uh, yeah, you'll start to see. Yeah, so if, if you actually go to the pmi.org right now, um, you can see the DA release notes, and you can see the types of things we do every quarter. Uh, because we've got you know, an overview of in, in this version, we at, you know we did you know these 15 things. Um, so yeah, you can see examples of what we've done in the past. So it'll be yeah. more of the same yeah. in the future. Okay, thanks, God. Um, we have less than five minutes left to wrap up. Um, I would like to. Okay, I think Ishmael has his hand up. Ishmael, can you quickly ask a question before I ask the um, agile experts for any questions from them too? Ishmael, you can unmute yourself and ask. Ishmael Kumar, are you there? Okay. Hi. If you're not there, maybe we'll just proceed. Okay. To um, um, Alex, Grace, the Agile experts, any questions for Scott? Any other questions? Yanni, Clem, Clem, Pete, any question? Okay. All right, Scott, so I think there's no question. So we don't have any questions coming from the group. But well, Scott, I must say this has really been an exciting, well enlightening presentation from you. Um, there's so much to really look into and take advantage of from the discipline agile. And I believe for I know many of us still have questions. Um, we still have organizations, people representing various organizations here across Africa. Should you have um, any need for any presentation or more pitch about DA, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I represent the Nigeria, Nigeria market here for PMI. Um, Andrew Yerenke represents um, Ghana market. Jordan Samani represents for other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but I believe um, our details, our contact details will be shared by my colleague Anthony to every one of us that has come for this presentation to actually know who and who covers various areas of the African region should you have any need for more presentation or pitch on discipline agile. But at this juncture, I must say thank you so much, Scott, for taking your time to lead one us through. I actually had a lot of questions, yeah, but you've now made certain things very clear to me. But I'm still going to reach out to you on other areas that still have concerns yeah. about the discipline. Yeah. But once again, Scott, it's really a pleasure really having you.
in this presentation. Oh. Any final words? Thanks for inviting me. Final word for Africa. Final word for yeah. Everyone of definitely. Africa, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, go to you know, drop by PMI.org. Take a look at uh, at DA. Um, there's a lot of great stuff there. Um, chances are pretty good. You know, if your organization is currently doing agile or getting into it now, more than likely DA solves some very difficult problems that um, you might not be. You know, that you're suffering from, and the frameworks just aren't solving for you. Uh, so, yeah. You know, but don't trust me. Go check it out yourself and take a look at it. Um, you can do this. Um, this is a really good thing. And like I said, this DA works with Scrum or works with Safe, works with Less. It's really an extension to what you're doing. And it, it really does help you to fulfill the promise that you've been made that um, then the, 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 the frameworks just don't give you the background to, to make the improvements you need to make. Um, it's really an extension for what you're currently doing today. Great thing to have in your uh, on your resume and in your personal toolkit yourself. Thank you, Scott, for that. All right, so I just jumped on once again. I'm very grateful to everyone of us for actually taking their time to really be part of this uh, session. So just to let you know, the next uh, webinar session that will be happening next month will be focusing on agile principles and values that will be taken by uh, experts, agile experts here from Africa. Alex Bagudi and also Grace Johnson. Uh, more details of this presentation or sessions will be shared to you. Once again, from every one of us at the PMI Africa team and the Agile Think Tank group, well done. And I encourage you to continue to be agile. Thank you so much, Scott, for your time. And thank you, every one of us, for being part of this session. You have a blessed evening, a blessed day, a blessed afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thanks. Have a great evening, everybody. All right, cheers. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much.